To complete our discussion on the light before we finally start working on our first representative painting, in this video we're going to see by the theoretical and practical point of view two very important ways that the objects have to interact with the light. The reflection and the transparency. These are two very effective tools that the light gives us and that we can use to make our work look nice and more realistic. Here, we're going to start introducing the concept of carried image. We're going to talk about shape and surface distortion, seeing how they're going to affect the interaction between light and objects. We're going to see how they work on our scene, and we're going to talk about acoustic effects. At the end, we're going to see some examples. We have already seen many times that when the light hits an object, the object absorbs part of its radiation and reflects the rest. That the reflected and the refracted intensity depends on the single photon's wavelength, on the material and on the angle with the external surface. Therefore, it is different in every single point. We have also seen that both these fluxes are colored, that according with the shape and the external surface finishing, they react in different ways. We have seen that if the surface is smooth, the light reflection and refraction follow somehow the object's shape, and if it's corrugated, the light gets diffused. So, when the light strikes a real scene made with real items, uh, according with what we have inside, it bounces in different directions with different intensities and colors. To make it simple, we can say that the reflected light flux carry the image of our scene in all the directions where our scene reflected. And we know, because we have already seen it, that this carried image is different in every direction. This is a very important concept that the carried image is relative to the position where we watch the scene from. It's time now to see how the things that we have seen theoretically so far are going to help us deciding what we shall represent in our scene and most of all how. To start, let's get back to our sphere. As we did before, we're going to set it on a flat and matte gray surface. Now, if instead to set our scene in a complete darkness, we place it in a real environment, like for example this attic, things start to change. To make it look more realistic, we can change something. For example, we can turn the surface into a square pillar and its material into some type of stone or wood. Now, if instead of choosing a very matte surface, we're going to start polishing our sphere, gradually we see that the lights get less diffused and we start to see something inside of it. In particular, we start to see the image carried by the optic reflected light coming from the back of our point of view. If we want to see in a better way this scene, we can change the material. We can use a polished, very smooth metal. Since metals are very reflective materials, we can see very clearly what the optic reflects in our sphere's direction. Now, let's change the subject, and instead of a sphere, we're going to set in our scene a cube of the same material. And we rotate it so that we can have one of its sides facing our point of view. In this way, we have a quite clear vision of the attic behind us. For example, we can see a wall. Now, if we start rounding its edges and corners, we see appearing inside our cube the reflection of other details of the attic coming from different directions, although very distorted. And if we keep going, we can see that the image keeps changing and changing 
until at the end we get back to our sphere with its distorted image of the attic behind us. So, while the shape was changing, the reflected image was changing as well, and it passed from a quite limited but realistic view to a much wider image but distorted by the shape of our sphere. So, every object according with its shape reflects the same carried image in a different way. And this is what we would see if instead of a sphere we sat in the same place, for example, a teapot or a statue or a coffee maker of the same material. We also know that the reflected image changes with the point of view, so our object will reflect a different image for each different point of view we watch it from. Now, if instead of a very smooth surface we use for our sphere a rough one, the reflected image becomes a little bit blurry, and if the roughness increases, it becomes very blurry. To sum up what we have seen so far, when the carried image hits an opaque object, it gets distorted by the object in two ways. The first related with its shape, which is a distortion, and the second related with its external surface, which is more like a blurring. To make it simple, at the end, if we want to paint a reflective object in our scene, we have to paint a different scene inside of it, representing what the carried image brings there, considering that distortion due to its shape and blurring due to its external surface. This is very difficult if you want to represent a realistic scene by memory, but it becomes quite easy if we use a model. Let's get back to our sphere now, and let's change its material one more time. But now we're going to use a very transparent one, for example some glass. In this case things are more complicated because according with the point of view, our object is going to reflect one part of the carried image, and is going to let the other part pass through. In this specific position, the image we see inside the sphere is mostly coming from behind, but if we watch our scene from the right point of view, we can see both the refracted and the reflected image. And also in this case, we can see that they are both distorted by the sphere's shape, and if we change its external surface, they are also both blurred. Let's get back to our cube now, and as we did before, Let's move it so that we can get one of its sides facing our point of view. We can see that the image inside is changed, and now, as we could expect, we see what's behind. If we compare the movement of both cubes, we can see inside of them a completely different scene. Now, as we did before, let's round its edges and corners. Also, in this case, while we do this, how we could expect we see some detail of our attic getting inside of it, deformed by its shape. To sum up, if we want to paint a transparent object in our scene, we have to work on three different images. The main scene, the refracted carried image coming from behind, and the reflected coming from the front. So far we have studied a single object. Now, we are going to see quickly what happens when instead we have a scene composed by different items with different level of reflectivity and transparency. In this case, things get more complicated because according with the shape of the material and the external surface, in both the reflected and refracted image of every object, we see appearing the other items of our scene. For example, if we watch this coffee maker, we can see reflected part of this cup, while well, if we change its surface, we can see its color. As we already said, this kind of lighting effects are really difficult to paint if we try to do it by memory, but they are actually relatively simple if we work using a model. Before we start to see these things by the practical point of view, 
There is one last aspect of the transparency that we have to discuss, and it's what we call the caustic effects. We have seen that a transparent object, according with its shape, is going to reflect and refract the light distorting it. And this is true for both the direct illumination and the light reflected by our scene. In case of direct illumination, these distortions may result on lighting effects visible inside our picture. Like, for example, these that we call exactly caustic effects. It's time now to see how the things that we have seen here works by the practical point of view. As first example, let's get back to the Caravaggio's representation of the Amal Supper of the National Gallery. The first very impressive item that immediately pops out is the water vase, where we can see all the things that we have discussed here about transparency. We can see that the vase is mainly pretty dark as its background is. We can see the wine glass and the table edge carried image refracting and passing through. You can see the reflection of a candle, which, by the way, isn't directly visible in the scene. Its reflection on the water and the caustic effects that its light cast on the bottom of the vase first and then on the table. Effects that we can also see, although reduced in the wine glass. Here we can also see the reflection of the carafe beak. If we move our attention on the other side of the table, we have a bowl where we can see in its dark side reflecting the table, but also its own shadow. On the fruit basket we can notice the semi-transparency of the white grape, which let the light pass through on the left, and gets darker on the right where the light reaching is less. Let's move our attention now on this work of mine representing a jazz band in a kind of metaphysic atmosphere. Here we can see how the use of both reflection and transparency, in my opinion, helped to give to this picture a more realistic feeling, even if the representation itself is not realistic at all. The first thing that we should notice is the image reflected and distorted by the trombone shape, which helped me to give the idea of the instrument material, and which, in my opinion, make it look realistic. We can see the same effects, although a little bit more diffused, on the saxophone and on the drum, while this reflects on the contrabass helped me to give the idea of the varnished wood. We can see the effect of the transparency on four of the five guys' glasses. There are other less visible use of the reflections that helped me to give an idea of the materials. For example, the reflex on the shoes, which in my opinion helped to give a good idea of the leather. And the use of the contrast on the cloth, which helped me to give a good idea of the different types of fabric. If we move our attention on this other painting of mine, where, in my opinion, we can see how the use of the transparencies helped to give a quite realistic representation of what is definitely a metaphysic subject. In this case, for example, playing with the shadows casted by these transparent objects illuminated by the candlelight, we get this drawing on the background that I have represented with the intent to give a little bit the idea of an abstract work. So, at the end, we can see how the reflection and the transparency are two very effective tools that, as representative painters, we can use to create more realistic works. Now, before we conclude our discussion on this matter, I would like to introduce the painting on which we are going to work on starting from the next video. The still life representation, where we have four very reflective objects and one very transparent. We have this teapot where we can see inside a quite clear, although distorted, view of our scene. We have this bowl where we can see reflected and distorted these eggs and the cup. 
where this gravy container that we have used with some milk, where we can also see the eggs reflected from a different point of view. We have the spoon where we can see a very distorted reflection of the cup and of the bowl. We have the carafe, which is a very transparent, where we can see inside a distorted image of the background. We have also an old friend of ours, the piece of silk. We have concluded our discussion on the reflections and transparencies. In the next video, we are going to talk about sketches. In particular, we are going to see how to make the sketch of this picture. If you enjoyed this video, we will really appreciate if you could click on like and subscribe to our channel. It will also help us very much if you could leave a comment. Thank you for watching this video and see you in the next one.